Hello, welcome to the Friday, December 13th, 2019 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Malicious software, of course, often tries to disable antivirus, and most software comes with a list of processes that it then attempts uh, to kill. Well, recently Xavier came across such a list, and it was pretty extensive, 233 different items, essentially just the names of executables that are commonly associated with anti-malware. So he went ahead to take a look at where else he could find this list of 233 executables. And well, he found with the help of a Twitter user, a GitHub page that actually has the exact same list. And apparently it's shared among a couple of different malware authors that essentially just copy that list and include it in their software. Well, this just shows again how malware authors are learning from each other and are sharing information pretty openly. I hope, well, and that's really what the Internet Storm Center is all about, that we can do a better job at sharing information about how to defend our networks. And in recent updates to Safari and to the underlying library WebKit, Apple has improved its intelligent tracking protection. Now, the next step here is how to prevent a website from actually detecting if a user does take advantage of tracking protection. Some websites may, for example, just not allow you to use the site if you don't allow them to track you. Apple's John Weilander now published a blog post detailing some of the measures that WebKit is taking in order to prevent being tracked, but also in order to prevent the tracking prevention from being tracked. And kind of nice to see that actually Google helped out here somewhat. So Google and Apple are kind of working together in defining some of these features. One thing, for example, the refer header will now by default only include the origin, so no details about the exact website a user visited. And there's some refinement in how third-party cookies are being dealt with and how storage access is being defined and how access is being granted. So in some cases, for example, it was possible to store data in a user's system using the storage access API if cookies were not available. So with a newer update now, WebKit is synchronizing the behavior of how cookies and how third-party storage works. So if a user already granted access to cookies, then the site is also going to get access to storage. And vice versa, if you don't have access to storage, then you can also not send cookies and so on. So a couple of tricky things that Apple has implemented here. Hopefully it'll work, but ultimately this will be a little bit a whack them all kind of game because people will always come up with little artifacts to track users, and then of course, uh, these artifacts will get blocked in the next version of WebKit. And yesterday I mentioned that Apple started implementing some SMS spam detection in iOS. Well, Google today published a blog post where they are going with SMS and spam protection. Now, first of all, there is a new technology coming around, Rich Communication Services or RCS. That's really sort of meant to replace SMS in the long run and works really more sort of like these native messaging systems systems like iMessage, but until then, of course, SMS is still going to stick around. One thing that Google is planning to do is introducing something called verified SMS, where Google will verify the numbers of particular companies and then treat them as verified and mark them as such in Google messaging. Now, the way this appears to be working is that the business will send these messages directly to Google, which will then forward them as SMS. And in doing so, Google will be able to verify the origin of uh, these messages. 
Not a lot of detail yet on Google's webpage. I tried to click on the get more info page, but uh, really only got an error message there. They're planning to roll this out gradually with some large companies being used as sort of a beta tester or early adopter. And Bleeping Computer has a nice summary of some recent Internet of Things malware. They took a look at the evolution of EchoBot. Now, EchoBot has always included some remote code execution flaws in web applications that are often found on these devices. And it hasn't just gone for usernames and passwords like uh, sort of what Mirai did. Well, there are now up to 77 remote code execution flaws that are being attempted against devices and of course the more people are discovering the more they will be adding to their bot. Well it's Friday again so today I have with me another STI student Caleb Baker. Uh, could you please introduce yourself? Oh, yeah my name is uh, Caleb Baker. I'm an IT security engineer uh, for American Solutions for Business. Uh, we're a uh, custom printing and promotional products company out of uh, central Minnesota. Right now I'm I'm finishing up the cybersecurity engineering graduate certificate. So as part of this uh, graduate certificate, uh, you have to write, I believe, one research paper or so. And this one research paper was about DNS queries. DNS, one of my favorite topics. So tell us a little bit about uh, what the paper was about. So what I was looking to do with my paper is there's a lot of solutions out there that monitor DNS queries for uh, intrusion detection purposes, uh, look to blacklist malicious queries or, or queries that are, are on their, their blacklist there. And so what I was looking to do is there, I haven't found a lot of research into, uh, you know, the effectiveness of those, you know, how much do you how much should you be trusting them? Uh, so what I was looking to do is specifically test effect of the, the blacklist were at, at blocking a selection of, of malware domains, and then uh, also test their uh, resiliency to obfuscation techniques. So uh, different methods of, of trying to bypass the blacklisting solution. Now, blacklist, you know, it's something actually I'm always a little bit opposed to because typically with blacklists, you kind of get yesterday's or last week's attacking domains. Um, what did you find there? Were they effective or... Uh, so what I found as far as being effective, uh, it varied a little bit per solution. Um, a lot of, uh, exactly as you, you pointed out there, there's a lot of the older uh, domain samples that I found uh, were, were blocked, but uh, most, uh, most modern samples were not. Uh, you know, anything. I, one of the things that I was specifically trying to look at, uh, I utilized the hybrid analysis uh, malware analysis sandbox and uh, was looking specifically for uh, malware samples that were not flagged by uh, a high number of virus total uh, detections. Uh, and so, you know, based on that, what I found was that um, I believe uh, I, I, identifying those samples was kind of challenging um, because it, uh, there's just not, uh, by the time it's already in that uh, service and has already been there for a little bit, it's, it's challenging to uh, identify a large number of them. But from those, those fresher domains, the Cisco umbrella was the most effective, and that blocked four out of the 10 samples I found. Overall effectiveness varied quite a bit between the different uh, services. Malware domains, especially for older samples, tend to be pretty effective, but phishing domains had a lot lower percentages. So on the other hand, you know, if you looked at samples that didn't have good virus total uh, coverage, I guess you could argue that uh, this is sort of you know, likely the case where the endpoint protection fails. Out of those samples that make it past endpoint protection, being able to block, uh, you know, let's say, 30%, is it still worthwhile setting it up, uh, you know, given the effort? Uh, Definitely not as a primary uh, source. You know, if you want it as a defense in depth and you've got the budget for it, then, uh, you know, maybe something worth adding there. The other the other key thing that I found was that uh, most of the different tools were were pretty ineffective at blocking even basic obfuscation, obfuscation techniques. Uh, so, um, you know, just simply simply pointing your queries to a different uh, DNS server was was enough to bypass even with the the client software piece installed that, that turns into the kind of a web proxy instead of a, just a DNS. So that's actually interesting. So even if you send all of your HTTP queries through this local proxy that then inspects 
host names, domain names. You're saying that just uh, setting up, uh, configuring a different DNS server on the endpoint will still bypass uh, these solutions? Typically, it will block you from, from manually setting it, but say you use uh, uh, you know, something like NS Lookup or Dig and, and point it to a separate server. It's not intercepting that, that query at, that, at the network level. So, uh, you know, as part of it, it, part of the testing was, you know, verifying, hey, you know, if you're putting this in place, you definitely need to make, need to make sure that you're, you're blocking uh, at a network level, you know, at your network firewall saying, hey, you know, any DNS query, not the DNS resolvers provided by the solution should be blocked uh, and, and push, put a flag on that in your IDS as well. Okay, so basically that's that's actually sort of makes sense that you have to design the rest of your network defense around using uh, that particular uh, DNS solution. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Now, uh, what about sort of, you know, attacks like DNS command control or data exfiltration via DNS? Uh, anything these solutions do aside from just providing sort of a blacklist for domains that may be used uh, for uh, these purposes? So one thing that it does provide is it does provide some logging. So, you know, even if you're, uh, you can have it uh, with the Roman client piece, you know, say you've got a laptop or something like that, that's off of your corporate network and, and isn't uh, sending all of its queries to your, your corporate DNS resolve. It does log that information. Um, so you do at least get that. Um, you do have the option to block uh, newly seen domains. So, you know, if you're, if, if, if uh, the attacker is, has set something up specifically for the purposes of, uh, of running this test, um, it could potentially block that. Um, but that even that was pretty dubious in, in my testing as far as blocking it from a black okay, standpoint. Yeah. So essentially what you're saying is, yeah, it works, but uh, not well enough to really rely on it as sort of one of the cornerstones of your network defenses. It may be sort of an additional defense in depth piece but in the end, you know, endpoint uh, protection, anti-malware is probably giving you a better bang for the buck. Exactly. Yeah. If you're, you know, if you're setting this up on a network that, uh, you know, you're not already running um, an IDS, you're not already doing DNS query logging, um, you probably are going to be more effective. Uh, it's going to be a more effective option to just go ahead and put those in place first um, and, and view this as a detect, uh, as a defense in deck mechanism. But to be really effective, it still requires of that client piece to be installed on the endpoint. Or so, because the one attractive piece to me for some of these DNS methods is that you can do them sort of all network based. So, if you have things like, you know, bring your own device scenarios and such, you still want to provide some security and you don't have the option to actually install things on the client. Exactly. And you can. Uh, you can configure your resolvers uh, to to point to their the, the uh, public resolvers provided by the solution. So um, you know you can still utilize it uh, to protect those clients. You just don't get quite the same level of uh, you know. So for example, with the the web the the client piece that you install um, will will proxy certain requests. You know if it's if it's a domain it hasn't seen before, it, if it sees it as potentially suspicious behavior, it can proxy that. It gives it that extra level of the visibility. Um, if it doesn't have that, then it, it does really limit it to just its existing blacklist, whitelist uh, of domains, of known domains. Okay, so that's pretty cool. Uh, so what's next for you? Uh, you're almost done with that uh, certificate? Yeah, so I'll be completing the, uh, the graduate certificate. The last uh, piece I have is the Networkers Continuous Exercise. I'll be starting that in January. I'm really, really looking forward to that. I think that was one of the, the pieces that was most attractive to the, the program for me. Um, and then from a research standpoint, just looking into uh, more automation um, as far as automating detection uh, or you know, automating response to uh, detection and, uh, and incident response procedures. Yeah, thanks. Sounds great. So thanks for coming here and talking about your research. A link to the paper will be added to the show notes. So thanks, everybody, for listening and talk to you again on Monday. Bye.